I'm Kari Rowe, and you're listening to the Foreign Saints Podcast, a pulse check for those of us who die daily. Jesus' people, his true disciples that want to build the kingdom of Christ here on this earth, wherever it is that God has placed you. <clears throat> and it's been a while since, um, not a while as far as episodes go, but just um, as far as time goes, uh, since we've looked at a story of a martyr. Um, well, in this case, not a martyr, but someone who has definitely suffered and given up a lot for the sake of the kingdom. And that's something that um, that I hope this story touches in us. Um, a few episodes ago, we talked about coveting and how it's a really insidious sin that kills slowly. And one thing that I hope is that as we go through this, as I read this story, um, that some strongholds of covetousness in our hearts, um, you know, put there, uh, that are there in our flesh and egged on by Satan and the kingdom of darkness around us. I pray that those things are confronted and I pray that this story serves as a good continuation of what we were talking about last week, as far as the call to maturity, as a call to suffering, as accepting the call to come with Jesus, accepting the call to come die with him, because that's really what he said, right? Anyone can come after me, but if they do, let them carry their cross daily. The invitation to life in Christ is an invitation to come die daily for him and receive his life and live it out. You know, I hope that this story, uh, you know, encourages you to pray for the spirit that is already in you because of the cross, for the Holy Spirit that is given to you through Jesus, that you would yield to him in your day to day life. Right. Like I'm reading stories of people who are overseas. Right. And there's a reason for that. Right. Because these people are in their home environment preaching the gospel. No doubt some of you listening uh, are called to go somewhere for the gospel, but many of us are called to be bold for the gospel, just as bold as a missionary. Take the same uh, level of sacrifice, uh, take the same level of willing sacrifice into our work environment, into our homes, into our family environments, and lift Jesus up high. So many of us want revival, but that's what it's going to take. Real prayer, real fellowship, daily, and taking whatever knocks come our way for it. All right, so Meredith is going to join us uh, in the back half of this episode when we really chop it up. Um, she's already read this story um, while, I was, uh, while I was at work today. Um, but without further ado, let's get into this story. Um Brought to you from the Voice of the Martyrs magazine. The title is Joyfully Serving in Hostile Territory. So let's get into it. <clears throat> if missionaries could choose their own assignments, one of the last places anyone would be likely to go is the town of Gashua in Yobe State, Nigeria. Temperatures hover around 120 degrees, clouds of mosquitoes hang in the air, the drinking water carries various diseases, and a powdery dust causes chronic eye and respiratory problems. If that weren't enough, Yobe State is ravaged by ongoing violence from local Islamist groups. If I followed my own wish, I would not go to Gashua, Pastor Elijah Ogunyi said. Like Jonah, Elijah initially resisted God's call, but God had been leading him towards a particular work since childhood. God had to cut my wings, Elijah said. That is how I became a pastor. Elijah was an unlikely candidate for a minister of the gospel. He was born into a polygamous family that practiced idol worship, and his grandfather was the village witch doctor. Though in line to inherit his grandfather's priestly duties, Elijah injured his shoulder as a boy, preventing him from lifting the heavy stone idols. From then on, his half-brother was assigned the ritual of sacrificing to the family gods. 
Elijah now credits his shoulder injury with helping him leave the village, avoid polygamous marriages, and stop worshiping idols. After coming of age, Elijah left the village and traveled throughout Nigeria, using his training as an electrician to support himself. By the early 1990s, he had gotten married and settled in the central Nigerian city of Jos. In 1995, he began to dream of a frightening, dark figure. The dreams were so vivid that he feared going to sleep. Then, in one of his dreams, he received a Bible that he used to slay the dark figure, and he was never troubled by dreams of the frightening figure again. That was when I discovered I was supposed to change my ways and totally surrender my life to Christ, Elijah said. After finding a church, Elijah began to serve as a prayer group leader when he wasn't busy with his family or his work as an electrician. In 2006, he had to skip church meetings several days in a row while trying repeatedly and unsuccessfully to fix a faulty pump for a client. When Elijah finally prayed about it, he was convicted by the Holy Spirit that he had been too concerned about earning money instead of trusting God to take care of him. When Elijah fixed the pump afterwards, it continued working. Since then, he said, I believe that whatever God wanted me to do, I would do it. Sometime later, he sensed God's call to attend seminary. I said to myself, I have five children. How am I going to cope? Elijah recalled so I ignored it. That same year, he was offered a lucrative electrical contract. Every time the developer tried to contact him, however, the calls failed to go through and Elijah lost the job. I was so angry, he said. I went into my room to pray. I asked God why. He said, the door of blessing will not open for you any longer. That was how God led him to seminary. When Elijah completed seminary training in May 2014, he expected to continue serving at his church, but once again, God had other plans. God sent Elijah straight into the heart of Boko Haram territory, a part of northern Nigeria where the militant Islamist group has wreaked havoc for about 15 years. At the time Elijah served there, Boko Haram, which had pledged allegiance to the self-proclaimed Islamic State, ISIS by the way, carried out almost daily attacks on Christians and government entities. The Lord directed Elijah to a town called Gashua in the Sahara Desert near the border with Niger. It was 250 miles away from his family's home in Jos, and the rough car ride took him at least six hours each way over potholed and dangerous roads. In 2017, Elijah and his wife, Felicia, moved to Gashua with their 11-year-old son, leaving their other children with adult siblings in Joss so they could continue their studies. When I told my children we were moving, it was a big challenge, Elijah said tearfully. Two days before we left, my second daughter said, Daddy, are you leaving us? I said, Yes, we will leave. If God wants me to leave, I will. The Ogunye family served at a church that had been established years earlier and had once had 100 members. By the time Elijah arrived, however, there were only five men, three women, and five young people in the church. The other members had been frightened away by a large-scale 2011 Boko Haram attack and ongoing violence in Yobe State. After the church was attacked, the people locked the place up and ran away, Elijah said. Elijah decided to focus his ministry work on young people who are at risk because of the region's extreme poverty and are targeted for recruitment by local Islamists. Christian youth in Gashua are so poor that many struggle to afford food and water. Elijah said boys are lured with gifts and Christian girls are frequently kidnapped, drugged, and forced to marry Muslim men. Instead of winning them, they are winning our children, he said. The area is 99% Muslim, and many people are hostile to Christians. Market vendors often shamelessly charge Felicia double what they charge others. The al Majiri, Muslim children who help sustain mosques through begging and are given to the mosque for education, used to throw stones at Elijah and his family and call them infidels. But Elijah learned to keep a pack of cookies with him to give to the hungry children. During the Muslim fasting season, he gives them water, and he has brought small gifts to those at his neighborhood mosque. 
Now the children look out for Elijah and guard his house when he is gone. They started loving us, Elijah said. Elijah's church has been burglarized twice. After the second incident, the local Muslim leader chastised the offenders and promised Elijah it wouldn't happen again. I've forgiven all those who persecute me, Elijah said, because God teaches us to forgive. If I see them, I will share the gospel with them. Though Elijah has won the friendship of many Muslim neighbors, he lives with the ever-present threat of a Boko Haram attack. A neighboring village 12 miles away has suffered recurring attacks by the Islamists, but so far God has protected Elijah and his family from harm. When we hear that Boko Haram is coming, we run. Elijah laughed, but beneath his good humor, the fear is real. We're afraid, because we know they'll look for pastors first, he said. Persecution is a part of Christian life. If truly we pastors are called by God, we should expect persecution. While Elijah fully expects to suffer persecution, his family's greatest challenge has come from Joshua's natural environment. They struggle with malaria, typhoid, and kidney problems because of the poor water. Both Elijah and Felicia have chronic eye problems caused by the pervasive dust, and because of the desert heat and unreliability of electricity, it is difficult to keep medications at the required temperature. I have never seen a place that has as many mosquitoes as Joshua, Elijah said. They fill your house when you open the windows. When you spray insecticide, they die and cover the ground like ants, but they come back again after three hours. Before you can get treatment for malaria, another mosquito bites you. It makes it difficult to be healthy, but we thank God that we are still alive until today. After living in Joshua for more than four years, the couple decided they needed to be based in Joss because of the decline in Felicia's health. They remain committed to their work in Joshua, however, so Elijah travels back and forth to maintain his ministry. We've made up our minds that it's better to die in battle for God than to die as a coward, Elijah said. I thank God for my wife, who is always supportive. She would rather die than leave God's will. Having experienced God's hand guiding him to Joshua, Elijah is committed to staying until God leads him elsewhere. In fact, he was asked to to pastor another church, but declined the offer because he did not sense God leading him to take it. We will continue until we die, he said. Unless I hear his voice saying it is time for us to leave, we will continue. Amen and amen. All right. I I definitely want that story to kind of stand alone and just really think about that. Right. I hope that hearing that story touches something in you, not just covetousness, but whatever it is that the Holy Spirit uh, would like to touch through a story like this. I pray that you don't harden your heart to whatever it is that the Holy Spirit is saying to you through this story, to whatever part of that story the Spirit is drawing your attention to. Hear what the Spirit has to say. Like Jesus said to the seven churches, Right? Hear what the Spirit has to say to you today. Right? And to whatever part of the story your heart just instinctively kind of recoils and rebels against, dig into that. What is the desire beneath that? That is one of the stated goals of this podcast, by the way. To dig into desires, to see what's really true. To see what to see what's really good right? Why? What, what is this reticence within us that would recoil from a tale of gospel-hearted bravery such as that? What is that stronghold within you? Maybe it's a recoiling at God. I don't, I, I don't want, I don't feel like my Christianity should require me to give up my luxury. Maybe it's, God, how can I trust you? How can I continue to march forward with failing health? Whatever it is, dig into it. Because I promise you, your God has an answer within himself. All right? We're going to have an intermission now. Think about it, all right? Think about it as the intermission plays. And when we come back, Meredith and I are going to dissect what kind of touches us in that story. And hopefully, it feeds you comforts you and challenges you all the same be right back with the show 
It was years ago that I actually came up with the slogan of Foreign Saints when I was still living in Okinawa, Japan. It's the flagship verse for this podcast, actually. Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body, by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. What I envision for this podcast, and I've said it before, but I'll say it again, what I envision for this podcast is to do exactly what that verse says, to remind you lovingly, encouragingly, but toughly at the same time, that we are foreigners in this world. We are citizens of a different land, and we are waiting for our Savior to come and invade this land and bring our kingdom here. And we're building it here now as a foretaste of what he will do, right? As foreigners to this land, to this realm, we don't pine after the high life and the high society living that this world has to offer it's not like it's wrong or anything like that per se but it's not kingdom and it's not about pleasing our king right we are waiting for our savior and as the son of man said in the gospel of luke when he comes will he find faith on the earth i want us to be a community of people that when jesus comes in his kingdom, looking for those who have faith, he can turn to us and say, faithful, you were waiting on me. Let's get the kingdom started now. Hey, just encouragement as we go through the trials of life. And now, back to the show. All right, welcome back to the show. A pulse check for those who die daily, foreign saints. Meredith has returned. Hello, hello. Welcome back. Welcome back. She is quite pregnant. Very much so, yeah. I'm feeling it. <laughs> Can you hear it? Can you hear it? You know, but she understands the story. Yeah. So she's here. Yeah. Um, like I said, uh, she already read it um, beforehand. Uh, we're in sync like that, usually. Um, but yeah, no, Meredith, would you, you know, what was, your, what was your main takeaway? And then we'll kind of get into like a bunch of because there's a lot of there's a lot of fruit mm-hmm. on this, you know, on this particular story. There's a lot of things that can really hold a person's attention. So what's what's your what's your main thing? And then after that, you know, just some other little things that you noticed. Um, I think first and foremost, just, you know, when he when um, when he like first became a Christian, just that instant recognition of this is going to be hard um thinking about like the family he came from and um and honestly like crediting what uh, i forget what the accident was exactly but it kept him from being a witch doctor yeah his injury Um, of his shoulder yeah something with his shoulder or something like that however he worded it but he say he sees you know what we would see as this huge tragedy um as an act of god's like sovereign hand on his life you know so like from the jump he recognized that this is hard but just going through the rest of his story just the recognition that it will continue to be hard um and an expectation that you know like he had a charge to any pastor and ministry that you know you should expect hard (laughs) um you know and i was telling you after i read it that like any one of the um things that happened in the story or that happened to Elijah that's shared in this magazine, like would instantly cause like the deconstruction of any American Christian, <laughs> you know, it and it has, then, I've spoken yeah, to yeah. you know, and then like a week later, you're going to see their like hour long YouTube video about the church tragedies and, you know, the whole ship, the whole shebang. But you see here, he knew from the jump that it was going to be hard. He continues to know that it's hard. Um, and that that's that's how it's designed. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, Jesus even kind of mentioned that too when he talks about the you know the parable of the king going out to battle, and the parable of the man who's building a tower, right? Like in both examples, like you don't start either one of those projects unless 
you know, you've actually fully assessed the situation, uh, you know, to know that you have what you need um, to go forward. And of course, the secret of the gospel is realizing that you don't have it and that God supplies it. And that's how you're able to go out and fight that fight against the king that has a bunch more troops than you and build a tower that you don't have resources to build. Right. But a lot of us just aren't told that it's going to be difficult. And Jesus says in both of those parables, but especially with the man building a tower, what happens if that dude, you know, starts renovating his house and stops halfway through, just leaves it half up. Mm -hmm. He's going to be ridiculed by the community around him. Yeah. And that's what we see. Like God's word doesn't return void. People try and build a Christian life and stop halfway through and oftentimes get ridiculed by the world around them. Like, don't, I mean, sure, they're not righteous for ridiculing, but, like, Jesus told you that would happen. Yeah. Well, it's going to be hard. Yeah. It's going to be difficult, man. Yeah. But how many of us have really, you know, reckoned with that and wrestled with that, you know, in the early days of our Christianity? It's like, it's a lot harder when you at least, when you at least think anyway, that you've been walking with Jesus for five or 10 years, and then you finally get a letter in the mail saying Christianity's hard. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, how did you, <laughs> yeah. how did you, it's like, how is it that you have walked with Jesus longer than the disciples entire, longer than Jesus's entire earthly ministry, plus the first year of Acts? And you don't know that it's hard. Mm -hmm. I really think about that, right? Like mm -hmm. when you say that I've been a Christian for five years, I'm like, okay, so what happened in five years? Jesus was only ministering for three and some change and then died and was raised. And then some months pass, like three to six months pass, and then Pentecost. Mm -hmm. So you're telling me that you've been saved for five years and don't know some of these basic things. And yet Peter, Apostle Peter became the Apostle Peter in less mm -hmm. time than five years. Yeah. Like, let's sink in. Peter went from wishy-washy to rock that Jesus will build the church on, preaching to 3,000, preaching to 5,000 in less than five years. And yet, we talk about five years as being like, well, I don't really know that much. Mm -hmm. Can't expect much out of me. It's only been right. five only years. Been five years. All 12 apostles were made in less than five years. Yeah. They just really want that to sink in, bro. Were they everything that they were going to be? No, no. But they were good enough to send. <laughs> yeah. Less than five years. Good enough to suffer in less than five years. Yeah. Whew, that's tough. They were made mature enough to suffer in less than five years. Yeah. <clears throat> How have the last five years of your walk with Jesus been? I'm not saying that to prove it. You got to go somewhere and get tortured. <laughs> but, just, you know, like, just be honest with yourself, man. But also just, like, leaning into being uncomfortable. Like, getting comfortable with the idea of being uncomfortable. Like, the, I think, especially here in America, we want everything to be as convenient and quick as possible but sometimes discipleship takes years <laughs> mm -hmm. you know to get the tiniest little bit of a harvest maybe um but we want that instant gratis like if we can't have it right away then what's the point of investing and you see like with you know elijah's story in this edition just how there was there was a long haul that he knew he was signing up for mm -hmm. you know and there's very relatable moments throughout throughout it you know the whole well, I can't go to seminary because I have five kids. Right. <laughs> you right. know, how am I going to cope with that? Or, you know, the the luring of a wonderful, lucrative engineering gig, you know. But then, like, for God to be like, yeah, that's the end of your... That's, that's, yeah. that's, that's, <laughs> like, I'm like, I'm like that's, that's wild. That's such a like, wild quote. Like, like, that's the end of your... The door of blessing will not open for you any longer. Like, ow. <laughs> You know what Ouch. I mean? We, we love quoting that Jesus is the mm -hmm. one who opens and no one can close and closes and no one can open almost exclusively in the context of opening up doors of blessing for us yeah. or closing down doors of hardship mm -hmm. for us. But he's also the one that closes doors of blessings to his saints mm -hmm. 
out of love for his saints. And if you think that's any different than what God did with Jesus, yeah. then look in the gospel of Mark early on, like chapter two or three or something like that. When Jesus has done his, you know, huge, like night long healing, you know, in Capernaum or wherever, pretty certain even the chosen had like an episode on it, mm -hmm. but like does that huge night long thing. The people of Capernaum want him to stay. And Jesus's response is to go off and pray. And the next time he comes back in the text, it's like what comes out of his mouth is almost a reassurance of what he's supposed to do in the midst of temptations of good things. No, 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 no. I, I could set up shop here and I could make a really awesome healing ministry, but I'm here to preach the gospel in many more towns to come. Yeah. And then die. Yeah. Like, no, I can't stop here. Yeah. You know, like the door of blessing was the door of blessing in Capernaum was closed to Jesus mm -hmm. by his father. Yeah. And you got life because of that. Like perspective. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? We but we get we get so short sighted, just you know, in our flesh and you know, not wanting to work to see things from God's perspective as best as we can. Yeah. Right. And I think, again, it just goes back to one of like the ultimate themes of the New Testament is this call to endurance, you know, like the perseverance of the saints is something that we're supposed to mm -hmm. <laughs> strive for, you know, and again, like going back to this story, like it, it, I think to me, that's just one of this, the, it is the most striking thing about his story is that like, he knew that was the call from the jump, you know, in America, it's like, not just do we not know of it. It's like if we know of it, we kind of push it to the side. Cause... Which he kind of did at first. Yeah. You know, like yeah. I know the call and so I reject the call. Right. Because, hello, I can make money doing this gig instead. And well, I, I have five kids to feed. Yeah. And our little toddler is expensive. I can't imagine five. Mm-hmm. You know? <laughs> Why on earth would I Why? make life more difficult? Right. You know? I cannot see a single reason under the sun. <laughs> Why Which is I funny because I'm supposed to be under the sun. Hey. God damn. Uh, uh, no, but then I think, you know, towards the end of the story, he was talking about how, um, like the city they were, um, doing ministry in was just not great for a plethora of reasons. One of which like was, it was pretty literally quite literally killing his wife. You know, she was getting very ill. Um, so they had to move to like a different town, but instead of just, you know, abandoning that ministry, he's, you know, serving the ministry of his family, you know, first by getting them to safety, but then continuously commuting back and forth to do ministry in the town that God called him to. Well, I mean, you know? it's, it's one of those things where, you know, there's so many things where, you know, sometimes we'll use um, calls that God has given us that we've previously sometimes even rejected mm -hmm. as reasons not to do another thing that we don't mm -hmm. want to do. Where it's like, God, well, if I do that, then I can't be good to my wife. And God's sitting up in heaven like, you were good to your wife? <laughs> <laughs> That's uh -huh. news. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? Like, like yeah. it's, 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 inter it's interesting how we roll. Yeah. Um, but I think that that touches on, you know, it starts to touch on the thing that really gets me. Mm -hmm. um, and I even mentioned it at the top of the podcast, how this kind of connects to, um, you know, an earlier episode on this show just on covetousness but you mm. see it played out here mm. where that's really that was you know that was kind of the thing that was touched was just you know coveting yeah you know and like what was what was his barrier it definitely seemed to be just no like just god telling him no the door of blessing just ain't gonna open yeah. you know like which is tough but it's even tougher when you consider the possibility that like some of us would still be on that hamster wheel if God didn't just put his hands on it, stop it, and say it's not moving anymore. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, like you should have got that already from the whole pick up your cross and follow me bit. But sometimes you don't want to hear that. And it takes God just kind of, look, you know, just looking us in the face mm -hmm. and being like, this, this gumball machine ain't giving you no more candy. Mm -hmm. Like, stop putting your quarters in, dude. Yeah. It's not for you anymore. Yeah. It wasn't really for you before, but now it's, like, really not for you. Not yeah. now that I'm calling you to something. That can't stay. 
you know, because covetousness, you know what covetousness does, man? Covetousness, it looks at its neighbor and says, I ought to be, I ought to have what you have. Yeah. It looks at itself and says, I ought to have the maximum of whatever is possible to have in this scenario. Yeah, when scripture calls us to take the lower. <laughs> yeah. You know, like we're not supposed to be equal or above. We're supposed to be below. Yeah. Yeah. We got to start building foundations, man. You got to get in the dirt for that. Yeah. You know, like rich people don't show up to build mansions on day one. <laughs> They just inherit the mansion at the end, bro. Yeah. But, like, you're not called to do that. Right. It's like you're called to build it from the ground up, man. You know? And and, and we don't want to do that. Um, And I was telling Meredith, it reminded me of this scripture in Romans 7. Um, I, don't, I mean, anyone listening to this show has probably heard Romans 7 before. But I'm going to take it in a direction that maybe isn't always, it's not always taken. It's in Romans 7. When Paul's meditating on, well, is the law sin? Since that's kind of how we, you know, he's kind of dealing with that interplay there. And yet what Paul says is, if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. Which I was telling you is really interesting because you can know right and wrong without it. Yeah. You know, same letter just a few chapters ago, Romans 2. The Gentiles don't have this law. Mm -hmm. and yet, they have some level of morality. They have some level of morality. So when Paul moves past that point into Romans 7, and he says, if not for the law, I wouldn't have known sin, he must be talking about something that is deeper than just basic level morality because he's already admitted earlier in the book, not admitted, he's founded his argument of the gospel on this premise that, dude, even people without God's law know morality. That's why we're all sinners. So when he says, I couldn't have known sin without the law, he's talking about a certain aspect of sin that is different and deeper than just morality. What is that aspect? We'll keep reading and he kind of lets you know. Um, but as I said to you, like what Paul is going to reveal about his own inner heart is something that I don't think is possible to truthfully conclude if you're reading any other thing about Paul in the New Testament. Yeah. Because he is so opposite what we're about to read that it kind of makes you pause and be like, Paul, you didn't struggle with that. I, I re I've read your letters. I've read the MacArthur Study Bible. I've read all this other stuff. Like, I know what you struggled with. And Paul's like, no, you didn't. Mm -hmm. No, you didn't. You saw what I became. Yeah. You don't know what I struggled with as a Pharisee of Pharisees. And it makes so much sense when you remember that that was his status. Trained by Gamaliel, the biggest Jewish rabbi of the time, and like still the biggest one respected from that time in antiquity. What does Paul say? He says, I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said you shall not covet. But sin, in this context, coveting, Seizing an opportunity through the commandment produced in me all kinds of covetousness. Yo, that's not the apostle. That's not the picture of Paul that we have in our heads. Mm -hmm. A man whose chief sin struggle in his heart. Coveting? Yeah. What? <laughs> yeah. You know, like, like, you think, like, maybe, like, pride or you would think pride, you know, something he was a Pharisee, day, you know, but coveting, like, you just want what other people have. That was your thing, Paul. Yeah. And it's like, well, I guess it makes sense. Like, Pharisees were top dogs. I guess it's not entirely out of the picture, but and there said, is an element of pride that's like embedded in covetousness. Yeah. But, like, it's different. It is different. Yeah. You know, like, but it's like, you're telling me that the same man that wrote Philippians 3 and 4 <laughs> mm -hmm. had an issue with coveting. The same man who would eventually go on to say, I have learned the secret to contentment. I've learned how to handle abundance and being poor. And we look at that as cute Christian poetry. But considering that it comes from a man whose self-professed sin was coveting, in so much like it was such it was such a part of Paul that Paul could say, 
I didn't even know the depth of my own sin until God's law revealed the depth of coveting within me. Hmm. That man was brought to a point where he could say, I know how to handle abundance. <laughs> I, 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 I need you to hear how miraculous yeah. that is. We look at Philippians 4 and think it's miraculous that Paul could handle poverty. And in, yeah. some, and in some sense, and in some sense, it is miraculous that a covetous heart can handle poverty. It's much more miraculous when a self-proclaimed coveter can handle riches yes. and can handle comfort without going off the rails. Yeah. What? Yeah. Like, wow, man. Wow. And it, and it should make us stop and think that Paul highlights coveting as the thing that brought him, that broke him. Yeah. What made you realize that you were a sinner in desperate need of a savior? Was it the classic man struggle, Paul? No, I'm a Pharisee. Mm -hmm. It's not my issue. Whoa. All right, well, okay, sir. <laughs> all right, well, um, was it anger? No, probably should have been the way he was going after Christians, but no, wasn't that. It's coveting. Yeah. And you want to know what coveting is? Like, from the words of Jesus himself, I'm going to say the definition. I'm going to let Meredith speak while I look for the scripture to quote from. But Jesus legit just says it's the belief that the, that, your life is found in the abundance of your possessions. Yeah. Yeah. Like what? What do you even do with that definition? Yeah. That's like our whole training from kindergarten. <laughs> yeah, really. No, but it's just that again, I think that it makes sense for it to be at the end of the Ten Commandments. Yeah. Like it, it does. You know, it, it is very much so a culmination of all the other things. Um, and it's in its own way, you know. In conclusion. Yeah, in conclusion. Don't cover it. <laughs> yeah, right. Like all of these things you could say, like all of the uh, first nine, you could say are rooted in. You could. Coveting. You, you could. Know? Thinking that life's about you. Yeah. So Think that life's about you. So you're so you don't murder. honor your parents. So yeah. you murder. So, so yeah. you do it. Like that's what it is, man. Yeah. The first commandment is God's God. And the last commandment is you're don't not. try to be. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh my gosh, yeah. dude. And I did find it, by the way. Um, Luke 12. Parable. You know what, man? I'm, I'm going to let you know right now. This was in the middle of Jesus preaching a sermon. He's preaching a sermon. And the point that he's on when he gets interrupted by a coveting man is everyone who acknowledges me before men, the Son of Man, also will acknowledge before the angels of God. Just be honest. When all of us are reading that passage, no matter our level of maturity, if we care about Jesus, we're gripped. I was like, oh, crap. Whoa. The Son of Man, like, denies people before angels, too? I don't want that to be me. Mm -hmm. You know? We're sitting here reading it. We're not even listening to it. There was yeah. a guy back then who heard Jesus preaching that, and in the middle of that point, does this. Someone in the crowd said to him, What? Yeah. You're interrupting Jesus when he's talking about acknowledging and not acknowledging people in eternity? Yeah. And you think you have something worthy of adding to the discussion <laughs> at this point. Yeah. This is crazy, but hold on to that. And he says, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Brother, I'm talking about <laughs> eternal life. Yeah. And you're here talking about, can you be an arbiter of my dad's will? Yeah, really? Crazy. Yeah. Crazy. Jesus responds, man... Who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? I don't know if there's anywhere else where Jesus just responds with, man, <laughs> dude, really? Now? We're doing this now. Yeah. Come on, man. He And what he said to him is so interesting. Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness. The text says he said to them. So in other words, he didn't even acknowledge this man's request and instead turned him into a parable example during his sermon. <laughs> yeah. What he said was so off the wall that Jesus didn't even, like... Respond to him. He just made it the sermon point. Yeah. He's like, you see this dude? You see this fool? And why do I say fool? Because that's he makes him the fool in the parable. Mm -hmm. See this fool? Let me tell you a story. To be on your guard against all covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. 
And he told them a parable, saying, The land of a rich man, this idiot, produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, What shall I do, for I have nowhere to store my crops? Like I said, he's making an example of this dude. And he said, I'll do this. I'll tear down my barns and build larger ones. Dude, he's making an example of him to the crowd. You just can't hear the emphasis through the paper. <laughs> I'll do this. I'll tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I'll store all my grain and my goods. And I'll say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, fool, silence. This night your soul is required of you. And the things you've prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. And then, just to make this even harder on us, he transitions from that into the usual teaching of don't be anxious about your life. The birds, the lilies, all mm -hmm. that. That is in the context of Stop coveting. answering coveting. You want to know why you're anxious about, why, why you're racked with anxiety? It's probably because there's covetousness down there that needs to be rooted out. You think you missed your dose of antidepressants. And some of y'all did. Please take them. But the rest of y'all? Yeah, you're just in your own head. You're Paul How in about Ro you? Yeah, you're Paul in Romans 7. Yeah. My heart's producing in me all kinds of covetousness, and I don't have the all-powerfulness necessary to control life in such a way as to answer all those evil desires. Yeah. So I'm anxious. Yeah. Right? And it causes you to interrupt what Jesus is wanting to say to your soul. We look at that man and we think he's a fool because, you know, he was. Yeah. But we are. When God's like, look, this is what I want for your life and this is the way I want ministry to go. And then we're like, you know, as he's laying out the plan for how he's going to use us to build an eternal kingdom and shepherd people back to the creator of their souls, we interrupt with our hand up and say, teacher, teacher, <laughs> um, about my 401k. Yeah, really. When's Fool! When can I retire? <laughs> Fool! At 65. What about my career plans, God? Yeah. And God's like, I'm trying to talk kingdom things with you. I'm trying to talk eternal things with you. Yeah. And you want to talk floor plans at a mansion? Yeah. What's wrong with you? Yeah. What is actually wrong with you? We have the diagnosis already, but most of us just don't want to hear it. You know? And it's like, that's, that's tough. You know, but we, you know, even we got to wrestle with that. You know, like life ain't about us. Yeah. You know, and, that, and that's such a constant fight. You know? I talk about it all the time on this pod, man. Meredith? As yeah. far as, you know, as far as like your end of it goes. No, just, again, I think every time I'm flipping through any of these murders stories, like, it just, it's, it's a continual come back to Jesus moment of, like, <laughs> reevaluate your priorities, you know, like, not saying, like you said earlier, that you have to sign up to go, and you get know, tortured. and get tortured or plant a church in Afghanistan or whatever, fill in the blank. But that's just another kind of self-righteousness if you do it for the wrong. Right. Reasons. Exactly. But I think it's it's just remember to like lean in to the uncomfortableness that God is probably calling you to. <laughs> and, it's, and it's not weird and it doesn't mean that you're doing yeah, it wrong. Right. You know, uh, uncomfortable isn't bad. Right. <clears throat> yeah. Lean into it. It's like, man, like you want to know, you want to know how much covetousness is in your heart. Go back to that chapter in Luke that I quoted, go to the end of it mm -hmm. and see where Jesus commands his people to sell, to give up their things, sell their things and give the money to the poor. And where your mind will go is, but I can't sell everything. Yeah. I don't want to do that, God. But I, I couldn't families. do that. I have a family to feed. I have two responses to that. One, if God told us, then all of us should do it. And two... Um, it reveals your covetousness because the text didn't actually say all now, did it? Mm -hmm. It just said sell it of your possessions. Mm -hmm. Now, sure, that could be all. Could just be some. But now that I say that, notice your reluctance at even selling one of your possessions. Yeah. Wouldn't even know what sin is truly until you actually start digging into what covetousness is. And then you can completely see how, ooh, 
Yeah, the kingdom and covenant don't mix. Because coveting is not going to give up an inch of ground that it thinks it's entitled to. Yeah. And we think we're entitled to much. Yeah. Which is funny, too, because, you know, we like to talk bad about the younger generation, like they're entitled. And yet in First John, I only see pride of life really being ascribed to older generation mm-hmm. in context. Yeah. Pride of life. Well, young people can't really have that because they ain't have much of one yet. Yet. Pride of life sounds like that's a grown-up thing, like it's an adult thing. Like, God, I'm too grown to have a childlike faith. Yeah. God, that's for the teenagers. That's for the single people in the congregation. That's not for me now that I've made it and built something, God. You can't ask me to give that up. Yeah. Pride of life. Yeah. Pride of life. Yeah, he can. And yeah, he does. And we're doing our best to answer that call, and it has been mad difficult. But, oh, my gosh, I look at people in the world, and I'm like, you ain't even living. Mm-hmm. You ain't even living until you put it all on the, on the line for the kingdom, dog. Yep. Come on, man. Now go die to yourself. That's what I'm saying, man. Like, go die to yourself today, man. Go do it. Go do it, man. I'm going to end it off early. This week, I think that's a good place to stop. Short episode, powerful gut punch. Um, We'll be back with something just as powerful next time. You want to do gluttony next time? I know you've been asking for it for a while. That's where we're going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On that note, I'm going to go get some brownies. Sure, sure. Coveting of the plate. Gluttony. Next time on (laughs) Foreign Saints. But for now, man, for now, go serve your king, dude. Go serve your king best you know how. Make some disciples. Tell someone about Jesus. Encourage someone in the body. You know the works. Later.